Well, good afternoon to all, and we thank the Lord that another year um, we have the opportunity to um, be around His Word and to learn something of the preciousness of the person of the Lord Jesus. We trust that the Spirit of God would give liberty, that there would be simplicity and clarity as we um, seek to examine together this wonderful portion on the feasts of Jehovah. Now, I like to think of the Old Testament as a wonderful picture book in which the Lord uses pictures and types to bring us or to help us to understand what it is that occupies his own heart, what he finds joy and delight in. And what is it that delights the heart of God? What is it that he wants to share with us and to bring us, as it were, into fellowship with himself on? And it is none other than the person of our blessed Lord Jesus. Now, all the types of the Old Testament, if we think of the tabernacle, they point, they speak of the Lord Jesus. If we think of the offerings, the burnt offering, and the meal offering, and the trespass offering, and all the offerings, they point us to the Lord Jesus. And this afternoon, we would like to consider the feasts of Jehovah. And I'm sure that with the help of the Spirit of God, we would see how these feasts of Jehovah point us to this person that the Lord has before his eyes and his heart, uh, the Lord Jesus. But before we get into the feasts of Jehovah in particular, I wanted us to just talk a little bit of the thought of a feast. And I wanted to look at Genesis chapter uh, 21. You would remember in Genesis 21, we have the incident of the birth of Isaac. And then in verse 8 it says, The child grew... And was weaned. And Abraham, his father, made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. His father made a great feast. And then in Matthew 22, remember the incident where it speaks of a certain Matthew chapter 22, verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who made a marriage feast. Now, I know in our translation it says the marriage for his son, but in new translation, the Darby says a marriage feast for his son. And I also remember in Luke chapter 15, you remember the prodigal son, when he comes back home, how his father would make a feast. And it would let us eat and be merry. So I wanted to think of a feast. Oftentimes when we think of a feast, it's a time of celebration. It's a time of Rejoicing. There is fellowship and there is communion. There is a thought of sharing. Having others to come, as it were, and to be able to enjoy and enter a little bit into the joy of the host. He wants to share. You know, when you think um, of, as human beings, we all enjoy having others around us, family and, and friends. 
and to enjoy together, to share. And so here we have the thought of the feast of Jehovah, the thought of a host desiring that his guests would come and share his joy and in his bounty. And so the feast of Jehovah would contemplate that Jehovah is the host and he invites his people as guests to share a little bit in what brings joy to his own heart. And so as we would look at the feasts of Jehovah as they're given to us in Leviticus chapter 23, let's turn, Leviticus chapter 23, There we have a record of the feasts of Jehovah. And verse 1 says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of Jehovah, which ye shall proclaim to be a holy convocation even these are my feasts. In the New Translation it says, Concerning the set feasts of Jehovah, which ye shall proclaim as a holy convocation, these are my set feasts. We have the thought of Jehovah's set feasts. A festive season when the people of God gather around him ministering to his delight. It's a fixed time. It's an appointed time as we have in the new translation. It's an appreciation for what delights his own heart. To have interest in what it is that brings pleasure to him. It says it's the feast of Jehovah. Now, in the New Testament later on, we'll read of the Jews' feast, and we'll see how things become degenerated. But it's the feast of Jehovah. It is his feast. And it is for his delight and his pleasure. We read of the Lord Jesus as the bread of God, that which Jehovah feasts on, what he feeds on, what he finds his joy and his delight. And also we have the thought of a holy convocation. It will speak of a collective aspect of gathering together, as it were. Conditions, it says, holy. They're conditions that are consistent with his very nature. What a privilege that God would desire to have people, his people, around himself. It's a wonderful privilege to gather in a holy convocation, a gathering, as it were, and feasting and enjoying and rejoicing in what the Lord would delight in. But let us note that it says holy. It's be guarded. That which defiles, uh, that which is contrary, as it were, to his very nature. We have to be conscious of his presence. It's holy. He's there. And then it says that they were to gather together. As it were, they were to have a common object. God would have us to have in view what he has in view, a common object. We never to lose sight of the reason. They were never to lose sight of the reason why they gathered thus. It was his feast, my set feast. 
Now, in looking at these feasts of Jehovah, oftentimes it's mentioned that they are seven. And when we read them, sometimes it's a little um, difficult to, to recognize or to count that they are seven. So I wanted us to um, kind of take a look and see how they're divided. So they're counted differently sometimes. Sometimes it's counted where the Sabbath is counted as the, as the first feast. And as we go through in Leviticus 23, um, it would appear that way, as if the Sabbath is the first one. And then we have the Passover and the unleavened bread are brought together. And sometimes we'd read, uh, even in the New Testament, where it says the Passover, which is uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And then we have the Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Pentecost, or what is called the Feast of Weeks. We have the Feast of Trumpet, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles, so the Feast of Booths. And there we would have seven. But sometimes it is counted where the Sabbath is not part of the seven. And so we begin with the Passover as number one. And then the Feast of Unleavened Bread as number two. And the Feast of First Fruits. Then the Feast of Pentecost, or what is called the Feast of Weeks. Then the Feast of Trumpets. Then the Day of Atonement. And then the Feast of Booths, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And this afternoon, I would like to look at them under that heading. The second one, where we look at the Passover as the first one, and then the others uh, following the Feast of Unleavened Bread as the second. But let us read together Leviticus 23, verses uh, 1 to 3. It says, The Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, Say unto them concerning the feast of Jehovah, the feast of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be a holy convocation, even these are my feasts, six days shall work be done, but on the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. A holy convocation, ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So the Sabbath is mentioned as one of these feasts. But we might notice that it is separate from the others, but it has the character of a feast. We would observe that the Sabbath was observed weekly. So the Sabbath is kind of distinct. The Sabbath was observed weekly while these other seven feasts were observed yearly, just once a year. So the Sabbath was ongoing, week after week. But these seven feasts, these other seven, they were observed only once per year. We have in Deuteronomy, chapter 16, Deuteronomy chapter 16, it says in verse 5, Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God had given thee. But at the place which the Lord thy God had chosen to place his name, there thou shalt sacrifice the Passover at evening, 
at the going down of the sun, at the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt. So the Passover had to be sacrificed in the place where God had specified. The Sabbath, they did that at home on a weekly basis. But these others, they had to do them in the place where God had appointed. Also in verse 16 of the same chapter. Three times in a year shall all the males appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he had chosen, in the feast of unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty. And we'll go into these a little bit. But it mentioned these three. Passover, and the feast of weeks, and the feast of tabernacles. They had to uh, celebrate them in the place where the Lord had designated. So the Sabbath was separate from the others and it had a unique place. And one might ask, why is it that the Sabbath is included with these others? And we mentioned it had the character of a feast. There was rest involved. The Sabbath brings before us God's ultimate objective, so to speak. The seven feasts they foreshadow God's ways of dealing with man in grace. But what was God's ultimate objective? What is it that God was seeking, as it were, to bring before them the ultimate end? It was that man should be able to, as it were, restful conditions. That they would be around him in a state of Peace and rest. Now labor and heavy laden is not God's thoughts for men. The world would have you think that being busy, working, endless labor is what consists of our lives. Uh, but the Lord Jesus says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I wonder if there is any here this afternoon who does not have Rest. That's the message of the gospel. The gospel goes out to all. Those who are laboring. There are some who are just busy, frantically, endlessly, fruitile toil. Some are even working to find rest. But we have in Ephesians, it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. That's not of yourself. It is not of works. Some people are trying to work their way into heaven. For us as believers, we start off on that basis. The Lord offers rest. And this is God's ultimate objective. When we think of the creation of this world. Seven days we read. God labored. In terms of the creation of this world. But on the seventh day. He rested. And God wants to have others. You and I. To have people surrounding among, around himself. In restful condition. God wants to bring his people into rest. That's what the Sabbath speaks of. And so we have in Hebrews, 
that there remaineth a rest for the people of God. Joshua did not bring them into that rest. But there remains a rest for the people of God. Ultimately, God is going to have a people around him in restful condition. That's what the Sabbath speaks of. That's God's objective. And as we go through these feasts, as we study these feasts together, let's think that God finds the light in having his people around him in restful conditions. And so, uh, I want to read quickly that verse in Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 4, we could read a whole section um, from verse 1. Let us therefore fear, and the apostles writing to believers here, I want us to note verse 11 as we go through. But he's writing to believers and he says, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we who have believed do enter into rest. As he says, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day, in this way, and God did rest on the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Seeing therefore, it remaineth that some must enter into it, that they to whom it was first preached entered not in, because of unbelief. In verse 8 it says, If Joshua had given them rest, then would he not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest for the people of God. And then it says, For he that is entered into his rest, he also had ceased from his own work, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Now, that is for the believers. Let us as believers, those of us who are saved, we already have rest for our souls. But as we go through this scene, this wilderness scene, we're not to sit down and lay back, as it were, and become, you know, lazy. We're to be occupied. For the believer, we don't work for salvation. We already have salvation. We work because we have salvation. We work for the Lord. But the gospel is, it is without works that you can be saved. So if you're unsaved today, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as Savior, it is come unto him, come unto me, all ye that labor. And a heavy laden. And I will give you rest. It's wonderful to see that it is the Lord Jesus that makes all the difference. True rest. Rest for the soul. Can be found only by coming to the Lord Jesus. There are many who are trying all other sources. Going different places and so on to find rest. Seeking rest. But. They can only find rest in coming to the Lord Jesus. I want to also mention that as we go through these feasts, it's the Lord Jesus that God has before his eyes. 
And if we fail to see the Lord Jesus like the Jews, they rejected the Lord Jesus. They could never understand the faith. They could never enter into God's thoughts because God has the Lord Jesus. It's the Lord Jesus that makes all the difference. So as we go through studying these seven feasts, we were noticing that uh, the Sabbath is separate, it's unique, but it brings before us God's ultimate objective. Rest. No servile work. Enjoying his presence. So let us look at the seven feasts, as was mentioned. The seven feasts can be divided into two groups. There is the first four, and then there is another three. And we would like to look at them from this, um, in this order. The first four, they were at the beginning of the year. The Passover, we're going to read, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits were all in the first month. And we're going to notice that God changed the calendar. And so what became the first month? We're going to have these first three feasts mentioned. The Passover, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruit. They were in that first uh, month. And then there was a, a 50 day. And then we have the Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. So after the Feast of First Fruits, there were the count, and we'll go through, there were 50 days. And we would notice that that would come maybe like month number four, month number three. So in the first month, we have these first three. There's a 50 day. Then we have Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks. And then there were month four and five and six. And then we're going to have on month seven, that last month of the Jewish festival calendar year, so to speak. Month seven, the end of the festive year, we have the Feast of Trumpet, the, feast, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So quickly, we we're noticing the first four, they come close together. Uh, and then we have Pentecost, and then we have an interval, and then we're going to have the last three, the trumpet, the day of atonement, and then um, the Feast of Tabernacles. And what I'd like to do is to maybe use two slides in each of these as we go through them. The first slide is to just to look at what was given to them in the Old Testament, what we have recorded in Leviticus for these feasts. And then for the next slide, to see what lessons we can learn today. What is it that the Lord is saying to us today? And so let us start with the first one. The first one then would be Passover. In Leviticus chapter 23, from verse 4. You would notice that verse 4 starts again with the same expression we had at the beginning. So that's why we said the Sabbath was by itself. And then we look at verse 4, and then the Lord says again, These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocation, which you shall proclaim in the seasons. And then he mentions the first one. In the fourteenth day of the first month, at even, evening, or between the evenings, is the Lord's Passover.
Now we will notice that it's the 14th day of the first month. If we go back to Exodus, where this is recorded for us, and maybe I would just read it. Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, and I think it would be useful for us to read the portion. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, this was the seventh month. But the Lord says, This now is going to be The beginning of the year. The first month. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel. Saying. In the tenth day of this month. They shall take to them every man a lamb. According to the house. Of their fathers. A lamb for a house. If the household be too little for the lamb. Let him and his neighbor next unto his house. Take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Notice notice it says now your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year. Ye shall take it out of the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. The whole congregation, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. They shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house, wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh of it in the night, roasted with fire, unleavened bread, bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor boiled, at all in water, but roasted with fire, its head and its legs, and with the inward parts thereof. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it shall in the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and you shall heat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be unto you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So this is As we said, we were going to notice, it says, Thou shalt sacrifice to the Lord at evening. We have this in Deuteronomy 16. It says, at the beginning of the months, we have a change in calendar. All things are new. They take, as it were, um, character from this uh, Passover. There is divine judgment executed, as we notice. There is provision for salvation made, provision for deliverance. Lamb, innocent victim, had to be slain. the, The judgment fell on the victim, not on the one who was guilty. The Jews were just as guilty as the Egyptians. It was not because of works. It was not that they were better. It was the value of the blood. The blood on the doorpost and the lintel. It was for the eyes of God. 
We think of those who were inside the house. They couldn't see the blood on the outside. But it was for the eyes of God. They were inside and they were feeding on the lamb. Then, in also in Exodus that we read, if we look at uh, Exodus 12, it gives us the law, as it were, of the Passover. Later on in that chapter, Exodus 12, verse 43. The Lord said unto Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. They shall no foreigner eat of it. No stranger to God. But every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hard servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth any of the flesh abroad out of the house. Neither shall he break a bone of it. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And so on. And then in verse 48 it says, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, Let all his males be circumcised, and then let them come near and keep it. And he shall be, and and he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. And so here we have in Leviticus chapter 23, it says it is the Passover, uh, it is the Lord's. Passover. It was a memorial. They were looking back, as it were. They were looking back at what transpired um, on that night. And so in keeping the Passover, it was a memorial. But what does that speak of for us? The Passover points to the cross of our blessed Lord Jesus, Christ crucified. Now these Jewish people, they could never really enter into what the meaning, the true meaning, what it is that God found delight in. They sacrificed the lamb and they could look back as to what happened on that night their deliverance. And so they connected the Passover with their deliverance. But God had something greater in mind. The Passover was also pointing forward. It was not only pointing backward to what transpired that night. It was pointing forward to the cross of our blessed Lord Jesus. That's the only basis on which deliverance could be gotten, sins can be forgiven. And so it pointed to Calvary. The Passover speaks of the death of our blessed Lord Jesus. It speaks of His work at Calvary's cross. Christ crucified for us. We have in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's turn to it quickly. Christ Our Passover has been sacrificed for us. It speaks of redemption through blood. The Passover speaks of judgment borne by another. It speaks of substitution. There was an innocent victim, a lamb, that suffered, that had to die, had to shed its blood so that others might go free. So the Passover, which was a feast that they would would, um, enjoy, 
It was a one day event. It's interesting that as I was reading through the different um, ordinances that God gave concerning this Passover, I am yet to find where they were to put the blood again on the doorpost and so on. I read often that they had to eat, feast on the lamb. But the shedding of the blood, it would seem to suggest that it happened once. The cross of our Lord Jesus doesn't have to be repeated. His blood was for the eyes of God. And God found satisfaction in that work there at Calvary's cross. So this Passover spoke of Calvary. All of God's righteous claim. Every just demand has been met there at Calvary's cross. It is the basis of rest. We spoke of how God would have his people to come into rest. The cross of our blessed Lord Jesus is the basis, the true basis of rest. It is the foundation on which all the blessings of God can be meted out to his people. All that we might ever enjoy, that we might be brought into. The basis, the foundation of this is the cross of our blessed Lord Jesus. And you know we have this thought of a new beginning. We have this thought of the first month. The cross of our blessed Lord Jesus is where it all starts. It's where it starts for you and where it starts for me. For all of us who are saved, that's where life really began, is it not? It's at the cross of our blessed Lord Jesus. It says, therefore... If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. All things have passed away. All life, all that's connected with the old life has passed away. All things become new. It's like our birthday is where we start to count. That's why it says we're born again. It's a new beginning. The cross of our blessed Lord Jesus. For Israel, you know, they think it was only pointing backward. But actually, it was pointing forward. For us, we can see, as it were, we look back at the cross of our blessed Lord Jesus. You know, the cross of our blessed Lord Jesus, the death of the Lord Jesus, does not only meet the needs of the sinner. And that's the thought where I said it's more than a memorial. It doesn't only meet the need of a sinner. But it is the great foundation on which Jehovah can build all that is for his own glory, pleasure, and delight. It's based on the cross of the Lord Jesus. It's the foundation. That's why I think uh, in our counting in Leviticus 23, the Passover is number one. It's the starting point. It has to do with the cross of our blessed Lord Jesus. I guess I didn't mention that when we were looking at these seven feasts, maybe today, by the help of the Lord, we might look at the first four. And then maybe tomorrow we'd look at the other three. But we would see how these first four have been fulfilled. And how the last three are still future. 
And the cross of the Lord Jesus answers to that first feast, the Passover. Now, the next feast that is mentioned is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In verse 6 of Leviticus 23, it says, On the fifteenth day of the same month, Remember we said this is the first month. This is in the spring. And so on the 14th day, they were to kill the Passover between the evenings. The next day, which is on the 15th day, now we read on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto Jehovah. And then it says, this feast, it says, seven days you must eat unleavened bread. In the first of these seven days, you shall have a holy convocation. That's a gathering together. And you shall do no servile work therein. That's the first of the seven days. And then it says, And you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. In the seventh day is a holy convocation. So at the end, there was to be a holy convocation. So it start off with a holy convocation. Remember convocation is a gathering together, like an assembly. So they would have a gathering together on the first of the seven days. They would have seven days. And they would do offerings on those seven days. And then on the last of those seven days, there would be another gathering together, holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. So again, our first slide tells us that the Feast of Unleavened Bread was associated with the Passover. It was on the 15th day, the next day. It just follows on from the Passover. And that's why oftentimes they mention together the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. And remember we said, if we are counting, that three times a year they were to go up to Jerusalem to keep the feast. Now, if they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, they go together. There were to be no servile work on the first day and on the seventh day. There's a holy convocation on the first day and on the seventh day. There were to be offering made by fire unto the Lord. Note verse 8. It says, But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. So every day. Of this feast of unleavened bread. It goes for seven days. And there were to be offering made unto the Lord. And there's another very important principle. About this feast of unleavened bread. It says that they were to eat unleavened bread. These seven days. Now back in Deuteronomy 16. It gives us a little detail. That I want to underline. As we consider this feast together. Deuteronomy chapter 16. Verse 1 it says. Observe the month Abib. And keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God, of the flocks and of the herd, 
in the place that the Lord thy God chose to place his name there. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it seven days. Shall thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, and thou, that thou mayest remember that the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt, all the days of thy life, and there shall be no leavened bread seen with thee in all thy borders seven days. Neither shall there be anything of the flesh which thou sacrificest the first day at evening remain on, all night until the morning. Thou mayest not sacrifice um, the Passover within any of thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee, but the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. There shall thou sacrifice the Passover at evening and at the going down of the sun. At the season that thou camest forth out of Egypt, and thou shalt roast and eat its flesh in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt turn in in the morning and go unto thy tent. Six days shall thou eat unleavened bread. And on the seventh day shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord thy God. Thou shalt do no servile work. So there we have the thought of the feast of unleavened bread. Now, what is this saying to us in the New Testament? What is the feast of unleavened bread? We have Christ our Passover, as we had mentioned in 1 Corinthians. But the feast of unleavened bread would speak of evil being put away because of the death of Christ. Christ died that sin evil might be judged, might be put away. And those who are his, they are to have no tolerance, as it were, for evil. Christ died for sin. And so sin, uh, 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 in a practical way, has to be judged in those who are his. So it says seven days. Seven would speak of complete, a full period. It has to do with our whole life, our whole journey here. Remember we say the Passover is new beginning. The cross of the Lord Jesus is a new beginning for us. So now we have a new life. And we are to live every day in the good of what the cross of the Lord Jesus has accomplished for us. Sin has to be put away. It says the, the full period of men on earth, our complete wilderness journey. No leaven in the houses. Leaven had to be put away. Leaven has this corrupting and inflating element about it. And all that was connected, all that was connected with that has to be judged. It says it is judgment to all that is linked with the old nature, the flesh, no tolerance of sin. Now we have in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we had that before, where we had the thought of Christ, our Passover, is crucified, sacrificed for us.
verse 7. It says, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump. It says, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, we had this before, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast of unleavened bread. Remember the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days. No leaven. No sin. Nothing that's indicative of sin. That is the whole pathway here was to be characterized by um, an abhorrence for sin. It says, Let us keep the feast of unleavened bread, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the leaven bread of sincerity and truth. Dying to sin. This is what it speaks of in a practical way. Done away with all that's connected with the old way of life. It speaks of the old leaven. Malice it speaks of. Now, as believers, when we have come to the cross of the Lord Jesus and we are saved, we are to be characterized by that which speaks of sincerity and truth. That which is expressive of our blessed Lord Jesus. We are to be feasting on the unleavened bread. How are we doing with time? Five minutes? Okay. So it's feeding on Christ. The unleavened bread. It's feeding on Christ. Seven days they were to feast on Christ. The unleavened bread. It was personal. Um, maintenance of personal holiness. There was a daily feeding. If we are to grow. And we are to be more like him. We are to be characterized by sincerity and truth. And so they were to make an offering by fire seven days. Presentation of Christ to God. It begins with a holy convocation and it ends with a holy convocation. So this first, this offering, it speaks of celebrating this feast ministers to the pleasure of God. This is having reproduced in us some of the features that are found in Christ, the one that we feed on, the unleavened bread. So he died for sin. Sin is to be done away in our manner of life. It speaks of the old leaven of, of malice and wickedness. These are not to find expression in us as believers. The old leaven, the old way of life, things that characterize us, you know. There's that which characterizes the old way of living. Now that we come to know the Lord Jesus as Savior, we are not to be characterized by that anymore. So the two points I want to make quickly is this. That we find these things that we're talking about here. Remember, God had given them as feasts to the children of Israel. They're pointing to what we have in Christ today. The children of Israel, they were going through these feasts. But these feasts, they were like prophetic in a way. They were pointing to something. God had something else in mind. And first of all, we have the thought of the cross of the Lord Jesus, his death. And then we have the thought of sin being put away amongst those who are the people of God. So as believers today, in the church today, 
These things, they find expression. There's something that answers to them. For the believer today, in the church today, we could look at the cross of our blessed Lord Jesus. And we, as we go along, we, we, in the, in the, in the um, portion we have in, in um, 1 Corinthians, seven days they were to be unleavened bread. So it's like on the first day of the week, like we have on Lord's Day, we come in and we remember the Lord. And then the whole week we are to live feeding on Christ. Sin, being as it were, not allowed in our lives. And then again, the next Lord's Day, we come again and we remember. So from week to week, we are demonstrating in this world features of our blessed Lord Jesus. I was told we had five minutes. So the features of the Lord Jesus would be demonstrated, would be expressed in this world. God finds pleasure in that. Remember, it was his feast, what he finds pleasure in. He wants his people to surround him. And when they did the feast of unleavened bread, what is it speaking of? It's speaking of a company who, as it were, eschewed sin and evil, would not have evil in, in their midst, in their dwellings, and would go their whole life, their whole journey here below. Bringing out features characterized by uh, uh, sincerity and, and truth. These are the features that are found in our blessed Lord Jesus. But it says also that they were to, and I'm going to end on this point, an offering made by fire seven days. There was something for God. And they were to bring, you know, on Lord's Day morning when we come in, there is that which we present to God that speaks of our blessed Lord Jesus. And it shouldn't only be on Lord's Day morning. It should be as we go through the whole week. There should be that which is of Christ that should be seen, that should be brought up as it were for the pleasure of God. As we live here below, the features of Christ might become expressed as we walk here below our whole Christian pathway, our whole life here below, should be characterized by that. So God grant, as we look at these feasts, these four, you're going to notice that they are fulfilled in, in the church and Christianity today as it were. Those other three are going to be in a coming day when God is going to take up again working with his people, the people of Israel. But for now, we can see how these things, they pointed to what we find in Christ today. God grant that as we continue to look at these other feasts, maybe we'll have a little break, and then when we come back, we will look at the other two of these four, the Feast of First Fruit and the Feast of the Wave Loads, and how they speak 